Hello, this is Opera Unbound, a podcast that breaks the barriers between opera singers and the audience. We will cover the process, challenges, stereotypes, and inspirations associated with opera. I'm Rachel Moss, the host, and this is my co-host, Mike Heitman. You can learn more about our podcast at www.patreon.com slash opera unbound. In today's episode, I'm solo, I'm riding solo, I'm riding solo, I'm riding solo, solo. And doing a soapbox episode about cancel culture and how cancel culture could potentially be a really terrible thing for the art form. I hope you enjoy it. What's up, everybody? Today I'm going to be doing my very first soapbox, and it's about a topic that I'm really passionate about, but also really concerned about, both in our society and also in opera, and that is cancel culture. Um, The irony of this is that this is now my fifth time trying to record this podcast, and after recording the last version of it, I sent it to Rachel she was like, okay, you need to basically expound on this because I think it'll actually prove your point better. So I did that, and because I didn't want to record it another five million times, (laughs) I decided to write it all down. So unlike my usual arrangement, which is where I just go off the cuff and say whatever, I'm going to read you what I wrote. So hopefully I can make this interesting by how I read it, and if not... uh yeah. For those of you who aren't familiar with cancel culture, cancel culture is the idea that if you've ever said or done anything that is now deemed offensive by just one person, regardless of whether the offense seems logical to others, you could theoretically lose your job, reputation, everything you've worked for, and possibly get doxxed all for something that is outside the Overton window, or in other words, society's accepted opinions. What you may have done is completely legal, but there are a lot of professionally aggrieved people who want to destroy others because it brings them satisfaction, I guess, to be that quote-unquote good person. Seems pretty ironic that destroying others and things makes a person feel good, but I digress. Should some people be cancelled? My opinion is no one should, for two reasons. First, especially in the case of famous people, all people are flawed. Some of the greatest artists to ever live had messed up personal lives and or beliefs. Look at Richard Vog- Richard Wagner. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Wagner. Um, Michael Jackson. People can still appreciate their art and separate it from their personal lives. Second, as time goes on, those promoting cancel culture likely will become victims of it. As they say, what goes around comes around. Another thing to consider is if someone is canceled, how long should it be for? Forever? A set time, possibly based on the situation? The jury is still out on that. Also, we're going after a lot of dead people, meaning, you know, like the Confederate statues, dead presidents, John Wayne. That's all virtue signaling and won't do a damn thing for people living right now. Those people you're canceling and or calling out are literally not doing anything to you right now because they're dead. Okay? They lived in a different time, and in some cases, a wildly different time. Who are you to say you would act any different? You wouldn't have all the knowledge you have now about the world, right? Because it hasn't ha- all the progress and stuff hasn't happened. Are you really suggesting you'd be so virtuous and insightful that the views you hold now, which to that point, like I just mentioned, would never even cross your mind due to the lack of them being present in history or the society, that those beliefs would be in your heart and mind, and therefore you would act as you would now and not how they did at the time of the uncouth behavior? 
I guarantee you 20, 50, 100 years from now, people will think some of the things we do and believe are batshit crazy and will want to probably cancel us. This is a never-ending cycle of stupidity and a circle jerk of rage that actually does very little to progress society. It does get a lot of clicks for media outlets, though, so at least they make money off of it. Here's some interesting examples of cancel culture, in case you, you aren't that familiar with it, and how hypocritical it is. See, the dirty secret to all of this is that if you're of a certain political belief, socioeconomic status, race, gender, etc., you can get a pass, but unfortunately not all people will escape its ever-reaching grasp. Martin Luther King. Yeah, that guy, Martin Luther King. You know who I'm talking about. Aside from all the amazing things he did, there were reports that he wasn't always the best to women. He also did a write-in Q&A with a gay teen for Ebony Magazine. At the time, Ebony Magazine, if you're not familiar of it, uh, with it, was extremely popular, especially in the black community, for obvious reasons. His comments to this young man, by today's standards, would be considered by many to be homophobic. A closeted gay teenager wrote him a question. He said, My problem is different from the ones most people have. I am a boy, but I feel about boys the way I ought to feel about girls. I don't want my parents to know about me. What can I do? Is there any place where I can go for help? MLK's answer was, Your problem is not at all an uncommon one. However, it does require careful attention. The type of feeling that you have towards boys is probably not an innate tendency, but something that has been culturally acquired. Your reasons for adopting this habit have now been consciously suppressed or unconsciously repressed. Therefore, it is necessary to deal with this problem by getting back to some of the experiences and circumstances that lead to the habit. In order to do this, I would suggest that you see a good psychiatrist who can assist you in bringing to the forefront of conscience all those experiences and circumstances that lead to the habit. You are already on the right road toward a solution since you honestly recognize the problem and have a desire to solve it. So, for this advice which would definitely be called offensive and homophobic. Should we cancel Martin Luther King? I guess we would have to cancel one of the greatest civil rights leaders ever to live. When Cardi B was a stripper prior to her Grammy Award-winning music career, she used to lure men to hotels with the intention in the man's eyes to have sex. She would drug them and rob them. Her response responses to it were i never claimed to be perfect or come from a perfect world and nothing was handed to me nothing and also i made the choices that i did at the time because i had very limited options so just to recap since she hasn't gone to jail for this to my knowledge her rationale was i had no other options she apparently had to do this instead of choosing a less problematic or legal or ethical way to go about living her life that's a real slippery slope to chaos if that thinking is widespread and becomes the norm. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Judge. I had to beat my significant other. They wouldn't do the dishes like I asked them to. Or, son, the money we had for food is gone because I needed money for all my personal vices. I had no other options. Guess you're going hungry. To some, these may be extreme examples. But are they really? This may seem like I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, but I'm not. I see where this is going, because it's already occurring in modern culture. Remember when they canceled Gone with the Wind earlier this summer due to the racial stuff within it? Gotta love how they nixed the first movie that an African American won an Oscar for. I'd love to know what Hattie McDonald would say when she found out about that. Too bad she's no longer with us. Next on the chopping block was the decades-long running show Cops, due to how it portrayed cops in a positive light. What many don't know is one of the co-creators, John Langley, was interviewed, and he said they overshow cops dealing with white subjects versus black subjects because they didn't want to enforce the stereotypes about black crime. But that wasn't enough for those people. Oh, contraire, mon frere. Then the mob canceled Paw Patrol. Yeah. You heard that right. Paw Patrol, the kids' show. Don't get me wrong. As a parent, I understand how certain kids' shows repeatedly played make you want to slowly scoop your eye out with a rusty spork, but to invoke Joe Biden, 
Come on, man. This is insanity. Going back to Cardi B, let's look at the double standard. How is it not okay for Bill Cosby to drug women and rape them, and therefore go to jail for it, justifiably, I, I will add, but okay for her to do what she did, especially after she admits it publicly? We can all agree what Cosby did was atrocious, and it was. But why isn't Cardi B at a minimum canceled? If not in jail, clearly the standard isn't the same. Speaking of applying the same standards, or not for that matter, look at how the media and some of the loudmouth people on Twitter treated Justice Brett Kavanaugh's 30-plus-year-old rape allegations from his youth versus Joe Biden's accusations by Tara Reid when he was a sitting senator in the 90s. Surely we can agree that the actions of a late teen, early college-age person should be scrutinized differently than a fully formed adult and elected senator. The people who screeched the loudest about believing all women during the Kavanaugh hearings were either deafeningly silent with Biden's credible accusations, which is their standard, and some flat out saying, I just don't feel comfortable throwing away a decent man that I've known for 15 years in this time of complete chaos without there being a thorough investigation, as Alyssa Milano did. She also came around to the idea of due process in regards to Biden, despite clearly not being for it in the Kavanaugh hearings. Is your head spinning yet? In the opera industry specifically, we have some, namely Placido Domingo and James Levine, who have had a lot of sexual impropriety accusations thrown into our discourse. They've been fired from their positions in future work, all from accusations. While a ton of accusations being piled up does make it hard to dismiss them, until it's gone through an actual court process, they are just allegations. You know, I could accuse Rachel of sexually assaulting me multiple times. For the record, she has not, just to be clear. If it was taken seriously, she might never be hired again. All over an accusation I made up. And that's what's bullshit about believing all people no matter what they say. At this point... I wouldn't put it past anyone who is hell-bent on taking down someone who wronged them to make up something to avenge the wrong. Sure, this isn't the majority, and and every, I mean every, case should have both sides be able to present their facts and let an actual jury decide the fate. The court of public opinion is so toxic, inherently not legal, and should not be the standard we live by yet it seems to matter a hell of a lot more than the actual justice system. To be more accurate about these two men, let's look at what was done to them in regards to these accusations. In the case of Domingo, Washington National Opera, LA Opera, and the American Guild of Musical Artists, or AGMA, the biggest and most influential opera union in America, did their own independent investigations. They covered a combined 27 individual accusations of impropriety, and all three organizations found Domingo guilty of abusing his power within the industry in exchange for, shall we say, certain favors. Again, these were not, and I repeat, they were not, legal investigations, so they do need to be taken with a grain of salt. The politics and optics of opera organizations of this magnitude are going to be taken into account when coming to any conclusion. It is 2020, after all, where companies and organizations are more worried about backlash and being sued than necessarily the facts. It's sad and extremely cynical, but we all know it's true. I can only imagine if he was found not guilty that there would have been a shitstorm of biblical proportions from a large portion of the opera community as well as others who are involved with opera. I don't know any insider information about the cases, but self-preservation is a hell of a drug. For Levine, whose accusations involved minors and were outside of the statute of limitations when disclosed, he lost his prestigious post as the music director at the Metropolitan Opera. He, of course, always proclaimed his innocence and sued the Met for breach of contract and defamation due to the things they said publicly about the situation. A federal judge found the Met guilty of defamation, and they settled with Levine for an undisclosed amount in August 2019. Aside from losing their positions in future jobs, the sheer number of recordings Domingo and Levine are involved with, both audio and visual, it's massive. Some platforms choose to take them down since they didn't want the blowback from people claiming they were quote-unquote supporting these lecherous people. Domingo and Levine were getting royalties, probably a lot of money too, though I don't know the exact figures. 
Here's the thing. By those recordings being taken down, it also hurts all the other artists who are getting royalties from it too, who had nothing to do with these artists' actions. How is that fair to the innocent people? So, cancel culture is stupid and will more than likely come for you eventually if you ever have a strong opinion and make the unfortunate choice of voicing that online or around the wrong people. Some actions will be overt and easy to spot, such as online outrage that leads to losses of jobs. Others could be that word gets around and companies stop hiring you. Either way, you're screwed. So you might be asking, okay, 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 Mike, but how does this relate to making opera better moving forward? The cancel culture mentality and path we are starting to embark on is going to eviscerate powerful art and only create conformist art. In other words, shitty art. And ain't nobody got time for that. This ideology is more prevalent among younger singers than older singers. And as they start pervading companies, especially in the positions of leadership, this could potentially be the death knell for opera. As much as I loathe the saying, I'm speaking my truth, because to me there is no my truth in most things. There is the truth and your opinion. Nevertheless, in this case, speaking my or your truth and being fearless is what is needed. What we need are singers and companies that follow the mantra, being real is better and more important than being right in society's eyes. Meaning, if we are true to the realness of the show we are putting on, however offensive it may be, audiences will appreciate that effort a lot more than appeasing the extremely small, uber-vocal part of social media that seems to never be completely happy unless you submit to all their demands. You know what is amazing about most people, both in the industry and audience, is that they can walk and chew gum at the same time. I know! Your mind must be blown right now. Believe it or not, the mature ones can separate art from its creators. They realize that just because a company puts on a particular show, it doesn't mean it automatically supports the views or actions within it. I'm pretty sure most people understand that if you put on Sweeney Todd, you aren't pro-revenge mass murder and stuffing human remains into meat pies. Likewise, if Dead Man Walking is performed, the company is pro-death penalty. Honestly, it's dumbfounding to me how some think a company's stance or lack thereof on a particular subject is something that even matters. What matters should be, do they do good work? If not, a social justice-themed opera won't save them, nor will coming out with a particular stance that is approved by the powers that be pull them to shore in a tempest. You want to do an extremely offensive opera due to the subject matter or how you're doing the production? Do it. Stop being afraid. People are already super judgmental no matter what you do. To quote Ricky Gervais, just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right. The same goes for people who blow up your social media after word gets out about your show and they don't like it. I'm not saying every show has to be controversial. I mean, unless that's your company's mission. But grow a pair and take some risks. If you do it in a powerful and convincing way, it will be hard for rational people to think you're the evil one the haters claim that you are. We have to respect our audience's intelligence and assume they can handle anything we put in front of them. They all watch serial killer documentaries, horror movies, and honey boo boo. Ergo, opera doesn't need to use kid gloves anymore. If you want an easy out in this situation, program notes are the simplest route. Mozart wrote some very sexist operas based on our tastes now. We can't be surprised he wrote them that way, however. That's how the society was at that time. Should we ban some of the greatest opera music ever written based on someone working with the most current information they had? No. Audiences understand that it's from a different time, and if they don't, perhaps they need to do some reading on their own about world history and culture. In fact, all people do, myself included. If a company is truly worried that the audience will complain about a show's content, they can do their version of, the views in this production do not necessarily reflect the views of our company or the artists involved. These kinds of disclaimers provide cover for potential problems down the road. Mozart is an easy one, though. When we get into things like perceived or overt cultural appropriation and race issues, like in Madama Butterfly, the Mikado, Porgy and Bess, even the Magic Flute, there needs to be discussions within the company on how to address overtly racial libretti 
and or doing a piece that race is a major part of the story when your casting personnel doesn't match those races and ethnicities within the show. This may mean tweaking the libretto, making changes to make up for people who aren't the race of their character, and avoiding stereotypical racial actions and or accents. All of what I just said is taking a pragmatic approach to the situation. If you want to do the easy route, do that. For the most part, it won't turn your show into a quote-unquote problem child that might wreak havoc. However, purity standards in opera are a minefield. While it is preferable to find the person who is the right race, sexuality, or ethnicity they are portraying if it is relevant to the plotline, sometimes that's not doable, and we need to make sure companies don't go under when this is the case. It's not hard to imagine that if you have to have a similar background to the character you're playing, that roles will be eliminated for people in opera. Speaking specifically of American companies, which use a lot of American singers, how many are going to be able to legitimately play in European nobility with these rules in place? How about murderers? seducers or seductresses and don't even get me started on trying to find legit bird catchers to play papageno so what about pants roles where women traditionally play boys the vast majority of women portraying them have never been teenage boys so how would they know how carabino really feels when he sniffs the countess's ribbon and gets an erection okay so the erection isn't in the libretto but it wouldn't be hard to find a teenage boy who, when the mere breath of someone they are interested in hits their body, they need to leave the room to avoid an embarrassing s situation. Some days, when you're a teenage boy, you are literally millimeters or seconds away from being the laughing stock of your friends in school. My point is, the standard inevitably will lead to friction and inconsistency in how roles are given out. Opera is already hard enough to do in staff. We don't need more rules, especially when the logic of the rules can't be applied equally to all. In the age of cancel culture, and where sane people seem to not have a backbone due to fear of retaliation, it's now time to step up and really be fearless. If by doing all this, opera finally dies, the final cadence will be as dramatic as the end of a Verdian tragedy. Toy toy toy, Amici! Thanks for listening to this podcast episode. We hope you enjoyed it. We'd love to hear your thoughts and requests, so leave us a comment below. For more information about the podcast or for extras, check out our Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash opera unbound. You can help support the creation of this and much more content for as little as $3 a month. Like and subscribe to our channel and also follow us on Instagram at Opera Unbound to stay updated. Ciao!